Welcome to the 12th District. I'm Kerry Condotta for NCW Life TV. Two weeks into 2023, we are getting ready to open the session. Actually, the session is opening in Olympia, and we will have Keith Gaynor with us today to give us a preview of that session. A challenging session for sure, since the Republicans actually lost a seat, giving the Democrats even more advantage. So we'll talk about what that means going forward. We'll have a short newscast for you to talk about some of the labor issues that have changed, important to small business particularly, quite a few changes for the state of Washington, even a much higher cost for Uber and Lyft rides coming aboard. So lots to talk about today. We'll get right to the news and back after that with Keith Gaynor, our state representative. Thanks for being with us on the 12th District. Welcome back. We'll be with our State Representative Keith Gaynor in just a few minutes to look at a preview of the coming session in Olympia. Before that, let's take a look at some of the changes that have happened at the state level uh, since January 1st. Uh, the labor uh, groups have done uh, quite a bit of work in Olympia the last few years, starting to get back some of the issues they've been working on for years and definitely have taken the upper hand. Here are some of the changes that have uh, come about. A posting of job requirements is now required for any business with 15 or more employees. That posting will have a salary range or a pay scale. It will have the general description of all the benefits that are available and identify any other compensation potential. Uh, they also prohibited any non-disclosure agreements between employees so that employees can talk freely uh, in, to each other, uh, colleagues within the same business, about their benefits and their wages. That was a, uh, those non-disclosure agreements were fairly common practice up until now. Uh, minimum wage, of course, a concern for many of the small businesses going from $14.49 to $15.74, now the highest in the nation. And remember, that's linked to inflation. That's why it's got, had such a large increase. And the fact is we are number one in the U.S. California is number two at $15.50 and Massachusetts at $15. There are still 20 states that are at or, or I should say at the federal minimum wage, which is still $7.25 per hour. That includes Idaho, right across the border, should make for some interesting situations between Coeur d'Alene and Spokane, being a wage difference of more than double now to $15.74. Uh, SeaTac, Seattle, and Tukwila are even higher. Uh, SeaTac, uh, the airport and the city are at $19 minimum wage per hour. Tukwila says they're the same, they joined SeaTac. And Seattle varies with the size of business and benefits, but they are between $16.50 and $18.69 per hour in Seattle. Uber and Lyft prices are going up substantially because once again the labor groups got a benefit package put together, requires Uber and Lyft to pay benefits and other uh, things to the drivers. It's a substantial increase in pay for the drivers and it will mean a 97 percent increase in cost per mile in King County, Snohomish County, Whatcom County. Um, in Vancouver it's only a 54 percent increase but in Spokane County it's a 147 percent increase per mile for Uber and Lyft uh, and in Tacoma, a staggering 279%, almost a 300% increase. So we're, whatever you were paying for per mile in Tacoma is going to go up by triple to take care of these new benefits. Just a side note on this, I was recently in Florida, used the Uber system and talked to several of the drivers down there. They are making a killing and want nothing to do with the unions or labor because they're currently doing very, very well down there. And uh, it was interesting to hear the two perspectives. All right, ag workers, of course, that's near and dear to the 12th district. Uh, we are going to see some price increases, I would assume, uh, because in 23, ag workers get overtime at 48 hours. In 2024, ag workers will get overtime at 40 hours, like everybody else. That will put upward uh, pressure on the wage system in ag. Of course, the ag community doesn't have any way really to pass that on. Those uh, prices are controlled by the markets. And last but not least, a bill has been introduced in 2023 as labor marches on uh, to give minimum wage to prison workers in the state of Washington. I believe that would be a unique bill. I don't think there's any other state that does that. Now, we haven't done any Seattle news for a while, so let's get caught up on Seattle as it continues to devolve into an abyss. 
Uh, Seattle Credit Union's been there since 1933, is now closing two of their 10 branches because of crime issues, verbally threatening, uh, uh, verbal threats to their employees, vandalism of their facilities, and break-ins on a regular basis are closing the Georgetown and Rainier Valley. This follows on the heels of so many other businesses closing in Seattle because of crime. Seattle firefighters last year responded to 1,500 fires in homeless camps. That's about 4.2 fires per day. If you can imagine the cost of running those troops out four times a day or more. Uh, these are at tent camps in 2022 in Seattle. And last but not least, the Seattle Police Department. 153 police left in 2022. There's been 509 police leave of the Seattle Department since defunding occurred a few years back. They are now under 1,000 for the first time since the early 1990s, and less than 900 police officers are deployable with 91 out for various reasons. Uh, of course, the results are increasing crime every year, including 57 homicides and 2,000 homicides in 2022. That's a 26-year high in Seattle. Well, there you have a little bit of state and local news. We'll come back and talk to Keith Gaynor, our 12th district representative. A little different 12th district he's representing now, with the west side being included. We'll have all that for you in just a few moments. Welcome back to the 12th District. Well, our namesake is the 12th District, and today we have 12th District Representative Keith Gaynor back for another round uh, after a, an interesting election statewide. Keith, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. A little preview uh, of this session, which I know is not going to be real exciting for either one of you given the situation. 40 seats, down one. That's not terribly different than where you were, but not what you were expecting, right? It's not at all what we were expecting. We, we felt like with some of the changes and some critical laws in the state that there would be a, really a, a different makeup in the legislature as a whole. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't materialize, but uh, you know, talk about exciting. I mean, part of our job is now to be uh, as prudent as in, in basically make sure that people understand the types of laws that are being proposed. And that's a, it's really a, Re real responsibility that we have as the minority to make sure that that there's a full understanding. I think one of the biggest issues that we have is that people are somewhat disconnected from the legislation that actually gets passed, and they're they're really not following the the bouncing ball, so to speak. You know, to to understand who's proposing the changes that they experience because it has impacted their daily lives. And if you can at least you know, connect those dots with who's doing the legislation, how does it actually implement, is it implemented, and how does it impact your, your, your life? And then if you don't make a change, then you really can't expect to have any different uh, outcomes. Well, there's, there's really been, I agree, there's two complaints that I hear pretty consistently, and that's that we're not hearing that news, the communication has to improve, and that Republicans can't do anything about it. Well, in a minority of 40, there isn't a lot you can do about it except tell the folks what's going on. Mm -hmm. I hope that happens. I hope you can find a way to get that out. We'll certainly do our part here because we're going to be covering this every week and you're going to have the opportunity to come and tell us what's going on. But uh, you're back on the same three committees. Let's remind the viewers uh, what those are. Well, I'm the ranking member on the local government and the unfortunate thing about local government this session is it won't cover some of the housing issues that we have in the past because they've created an actual housing committee that uh, it actually is a pretty good sized committee. So I know that that is one of the highest priorities that this legislature is going to be dealing with. The governor has, you know, he tried uh, you know, in the last session to, to push some legislation through. I expect that that'll be the same MO this, uh, this year too. But, you know, at local government, we will still be dealing with uh, the Growth Management Act uh, issues, which I think are really critical for allowing more flexibility for local governments to do their own planning for uh, additional housing. And I think that's part of the problem is that we've tried to do the top-down approach and we haven't listened to the communities and the way that, you know, is, suits their community best to plan for their future growth. 
So we, you know, we still have a number of other things. Uh, you know, all the junior taxing districts will come through our committee also. But so there, there will be plenty of things for us to work on. But uh, some of the things that we have worked on will have changed. I'll also be on the Environment and Energy Committee, and I think that will uh, be a, a real interesting uh, <laughs> development too, because some of the projections, a lot of the projections that have been made about environmental uh, stewardship have not materialized. Some of the the CO2 emissions that you know, were projected to be lessening have actually increased. Yeah, I just uh, read that recently, that we're not seeing the reduction in carbon with all the work they supposedly have done. The Puget Sound Partnership was something that was supposed to clean up Puget Sound. It has not met its uh, its goals. You know, so there's so many things that are going on, but in the meantime, we continue to pass more things without holding us ourselves accountable for the projected uh, outcomes. So that, you know, and of course the energy thing, the biggest issue we'll have is the resource adequacy. Do we actually have the, the, the amount of power that we need if we're going to keep moving toward the total electrification? Mm -hmm. So I mean, those are things that have to be worked out and I think we need to make sure that we have experts coming in, people who are involved in the industries that are impacted, making sure that we're listening to them. The other committee I'll be on is the transportation. And transportation it will take a little bit different uh, I guess twist for me as as a representative because with the addition of the the west side of the 12th district, some of the tr uh, transportation issues over there now have to become our priorities as well. Yeah, you weren't involved and, in that before. No, but <laughs> Highway 2 is still Highway 2, so the issues that we see in Leavenworth and you know getting to Chelan and, and those kinds of things that are. Uh, you know, somewhat tourist related, those, those impacts begin in Sultan and Monroe, which are now part of this district. And of course, North Bend is the, the same way. They have other is transportation issues as they try and get into Seattle and out. So, you know, all of a sudden I've got a, a whole different. Uh, <laughs> You've got a new world to deal and, with. <laughs> and and the cars. old one's still here. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, going back to the environment thing, there's no question based on the pre-file of bills that that's a big deal. They're still pushing for all kinds of new environmental regulations. And as you said, a lot of them that they've done haven't, haven't worked, frankly. Uh, the one that I want to touch on that I think people are starting to become aware of is the, the carbon tax is now in place. And that's going to have effect on all energy sources. But uh, the most, uh, the priority, I guess, for us is that fuel prices will go up. I mean, there's no doubt, right? Because it's on, but it's on the wholesale side, so we're not going to see an increase in the gas tax, but we're going to see an increase in gas. Is that the way you see it? Well, and in addition to that, we will not necessarily see a decrease in the emissions because, you know, what we'll see are, are producers buying tax credits from from entities that are now sequestering carbon. They will transfer some of that, actually sell that opportunity to someone else. But it doesn't mean that that other entity then would is necessarily decreasing right so I mean it, it's a there's money that's going to be generated and it will end up being paid by the consumer yeah and whether we see an actual benefit from that I mean the biggest issue is what is your return on your investment and I don't believe that you know we're going to be able to quantify that in the near future yeah, and, and as far as we can tell, the carbon tax collections itself is not necessarily directed at environmental issues. It's kind of a slush fund. And they claim that will ramp up based on the price of carbon in this market they've developed. So we won't really know what the effect is on fuel until it happens. And I assume we're going to see higher fuel prices. And just to give you an example, I mean, the uh, Commissioner of Public Lands had, had, has offered up about a 10,000 acre uh, forest to sell carbon t Credits for now, you know, I have to be, I guess, uh, be, they need to tell me about how by selling that carbon credit it changes the function of that forest. <laughs> it doesn't. You know, so I mean, yeah. it, it, it has been sequestered to this point, now we're just putting a value on it. Right. So, I mean, if we're really serious about reducing emissions of, of whatever kind, I mean, we need to go to the source and, and do that. And if you do that, there is a trade-off, and that will be increased prices for sure. For energy across the board. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you brought up something that I, a big concern for me is that the grid is, is in most people that have done the work, say the grid's not capable in this state of handling where they want to go. They're eliminating natural gas in houses. They're changing, electrifying everything, essentially, and obviously trying to phase out automobiles, uh, piston-powered. Um, but yet the grid is not capable. California's already seen this issue. They've had blackouts, rolling blackouts. Is there anybody addressing 
power, you know, more power, either nuclear or what we can do to get back forward. Well, there are things that are, you know, in play. I mean, even Bill Gates is, is buying into, you know, nuclear. Unfortunately, it's in Wyoming, but I mean, right. the and reality Idaho's is doing that it too. It, we're, we're thinking about it. There are some uh, mini uh, reactors. I mean, I think Grant County has been working on that. But those are the kinds of things that have to come from the private sector. There, there will be innovation to oh, provide, yeah. to provide the, the supply that's necessary. The unfortunate thing is that we have legislators, and you know, I'm one of those, that are now making decisions without a full understanding of what that industry really is, what it does. Yeah. And, and so I think that's why you know, I made the comment earlier about bringing in those experts and making sure that that they, they're at the table, they're telling you what is the, the probability, what is the likelihood that we can produce you know, an alternative driven source of uh, you know, electricity. And, and without that uh, development, you know, that only is gonna come from the private sector, the government is, we're not, we're not geared up to do that, we're there to govern. Right. And, and what we're doing is regulating industries that we really don't have a full understanding of. Yeah. And that's what's, you know, to me, very unfortunate. Two other subjects before we go. Uh, crime, absolutely a problem across the state. I heard this morning that in two major businesses in Seattle are closing. It's a credit union. It's been there since 1933. Is closing two branches because the crime is so bad. We've had restaurants close. We've had, you know, the crime increase across the state. It doesn't matter whether you're in Wenatchee or Spokane. It's, it's there, and it's getting worse. What, what do we do? I mean, what are these people, it seems to me they're gonna, the Democrats are gonna pursue the same path. I've seen bills that actually are reducing uh, criminality and reducing fines and going absolutely the opposite direction. How do we stem that? That's a, you know, it's a really good question. I mean, the four years that I've been there, I've seen nothing but, as you say, the reduction of penalties. And, and that comes on the heels of, of you know, be, if somebody commits a crime, if they plea bargain it down, now they're gonna have a reduction on something that wasn't even where it was initially charged. So, you know, you lessen the, the really the, uh, I guess that you, know, you lessen penalties and, and you know, crime, this doesn't uh, seem to resonate, you know, that this is not something that you wanna do. You know, I think more fundamentally, we need to look at, you know, where does this start? Well, I believe it starts in the home. And, you know, we need to be doing things that, that you know, really restore the family where, you know, parents are, are giving direction to their kids and, and they're making good choices. And then they, but more, most importantly, we're holding people accountable for their actions. I mean, if you don't hold somebody accountable for their actions, there's no, no reason for them to change their behavior if they feel like it's beneficial for them to do something that it, it does Im, impact someone else. I mean, at some point we have to say, no, we won't tolerate this as a society. Well, I think and shoplifting is the perfect example. Exactly. It's, the, it's what's risen the most. I mean, all kinds of violent crime have gone up, but shoplifting is off the charts. There are businesses that are literally failing because they can't put, you know, they're losing more than they're making. And uh, what, I, they've got to do something about that. Well, but if you don't, you know, uh, you know, respect authority, yeah, then you know, you, it's a downward spiral. I mean, whether it's in the, you know, the schools or, you know, wherever it is. I mean, people are put in a position of authority for, for a reason. Yeah, and that's why I say that, you know, that's where if kids understand, you know, even their parents are the authority figure. In life. A lot of kids today don't, they don't feel like they even have to listen to their parents. So yeah. I mean, if you start there, uh, you know, kind of breaking down that that respect then it's, it's difficult to, to regain it at the other end of someone's life. Yeah, that's a fact. Well, we've got another minute or two. Um, I just want to touch briefly. I, I know it's, uh, you all work on this budget. It's all part of the program, but this budget's amazing to me. $70 billion projected, another double-digit increase. We had a 22% increase last time. I mean, this is just astronomical numbers. If the economy takes any kind of a downturn, you're going to be in a, a very, very big hole. Uh, does that concern you looking forward? <laughs> you know it does. <laughs> yes, and it, you know, the thing is... It, and no tax relief, by the way, none. No tax relief, but even more, uh, I guess, troubling to me is that the state makes commitments to provide services, and they expect, you know, the private sector to provide those services for a, an agreed-upon fee 
But unfortunately, that agreed upon fee from the state, and I'm referring specifically to Medicaid, but that, that isn't just our local uh, you know, health care facilities, it's mental health, it's, you know, it goes on and on. I mean, all these things that are, services are being provided, but the state is only, let's say, you know, reimbursing about 60% of the actual cost of doing that. Well, is, you know, being in business yourself, you know, you can't operate at 60% yeah. for very long, and either you have to make it up from someone else, which is typically the case, the private insurers, you know, will offset some of that, or you go out of business. And right now, the state has really, uh, in my mind, we're failing our citizens by saying we will provide these services, but we won't pay for them. You know, to the to the point that we should, and and th those to me are the priorities that should happen in a budget before you start talking about any new services. Is make sure that you have a sustainable budget, and and honestly, from my perspective, you know, we certainly should be. Uh, lessening the scope of government rather than expanding it. We're making commitments that, that we can't we can't keep. Yeah, I completely and, agree. I've been there long enough to know this is a, a train wreck at the end for sure. All right. Well, I appreciate you stopping in. You're headed for Olympia next week. It starts next week uh, or this week as the case may be in this show. We'll be, you'll be there. We'll be checking in with you from time to time um, and keeping an eye on all this. I wish you the best over there. Now, one thing is you're back to normal, right? We're gonna have hearings, we're gonna have people on the floor that right now it looks like it's kind of the first normal session. It does, and, and that's exciting. We've been over there yeah. uh, a little bit already, and it's great to, to be back in the caucus room, be on the floor, and, and actually you know, see that the plexiglass has been removed, and wow. we're back to what would will feel a little more normal. I think that in itself will make quite a difference. I think they, I hate to say, got away with murder, but without anybody there to talk about it, there was a lot done that probably might not have gotten done. Let's hope that's the case. I do. We will check in a week or two. Thanks again for being here, folks. We'll be right back to wrap it up. This is the 12th district. Well, there you have it, a fairly upbeat Keith Gaynor, <laughs> and he usually is, uh, definitely a very solid state representative, but uh, concerned, very concerned about the where, where the state is going and how it continues to devolve in terms of crime and other issues, homelessness. Uh, Olympia will try to deal with it, but what they've really done is create most of it, uh, policies that have certainly increased crime and increased homelessness, and a lot of the, uh, even the labor issues we talked about will make it much more difficult to run a small business in the state, and that cannot help moving forward. So we'll keep following it. We'll have Mike and Keith on uh, just about every week to give, us a, give you an update on Olympia. Very important to follow what's going on there. As Mike said, uh, and Keith, communications are most important, particularly this year. So stay tuned to the 12th District. Every week, we'll be right here. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.